The cataclysmic event that resulted in the hostile nuclear landscape of Fallout was called the Great War. After 25 years of a global conflict known as the Resource Wars came to a head, tensions between global superpowers China and the United States were at an all-time high. And so, on October 23, 2077, a worldwide exchange of nuclear missiles wreaked havoc upon much of the planet, resulting in Fallout's wasteland. But despite the Great War being the inciting incident for the setting of our beloved game, there are a few misconceptions surrounding the world-altering event. Let's go over some today. But first, a word from our sponsor. This video is sponsored by World of Warships. World of Warships is a free-to-play naval combat game available on PC. Not only is it a ton of fun to play, but the game is gorgeous, featuring top-notch graphics, making it easy to feel truly immersed in their 12v12 arenas. There are hundreds of ships across multiple ship classes. You've got your battleships, your destroyers, your aircraft carriers, and your cruisers. And if you find yourself sinking more often than not, why not command a ship that's meant to go underwater with the submarines? The game stays fresh by having new content being released every month. You can play as a lone wolf or in a division with your friends. And World of Warships is honestly more than just a game. It's a unique digital floating museum displaying breathtaking recreations of not only revered vessels from history, but also many historical designs that were never created for one reason or another. Oh, and it's available on consoles. If you want to join me and countless other gamers participating in real-time naval combat, sign up using the first link in my description. When registering, use code BRAVO to get a huge starter pack consisting of 500 doubloons, 1.5 million credits, 7 days of premium account time, and one free choice of ship after you complete 15 battles. Choose from the USS Phoenix, Japanese cruiser Kuma, French battleship Corbet, Italian battleship Dante Alighieri, or the HMS Wakeful. Again, use the first link in my description, and thanks again to World of Warships for sponsoring this video. This is 5 Misconceptions About Fallout's Great War. Misconception number 1. It came as a surprise. The first misconception revolves around the idea that the Great War came as a surprise to many. While of course governments and militaries were keenly aware of the geopolitical landscape leading up to the Great War, as they acted as key players in the resource wars, there were many other companies, individuals, and other government departments that were anticipating and preparing for a global nuclear event. Let's go over some. Medtech Laboratories was a pre-war pharmaceutical company best known for the creation of Mentats and Fixer. They had a research center located in the Commonwealth. There, they were working on a chem called Prevent. Advertised as a cure-all, Prevent was expected to be available for sale by 2078. However, due to the Great War, it would never reach the mass production stage. But an executive terminal located in the building leads me to believe that the facility's director already knew that. Under the heading Systems Alert, the first entry reads, Nuclear Activity Alert from Head Office. It would seem that the MedTech HQ, wherever that may be, had an advance warning of an impending nuclear attack against US soil, and issued a warning to all their branches. In response, the director of the Commonwealth location enacted a containment lockdown of the facility, trapping all working scientists and test subjects on site. Well, except for one, but we'll get to that later. MedTech Laboratories was only one company that had an early warning about the incoming nuclear devastation. In 2074, thanks to a grant provided by the United States Armed Forces Defense Experimental Research Project Initiative, Cambridge Polymer Labs was established by three Commonwealth Institute of Technology graduate students. John Elwood, Erica Willem, and Wilfred Bergman were in charge of coming up with and designing an augmentation for the military's power armor units. This new piece of technology was designed to convert radiation into electricity and was supposed to help the US win the Sino-American War. Colonel George Kemp was the group's liaison and would oversee the project, and unfortunately for everyone involved, there had been quite a few setbacks in the project, leading to scheduled delays. This pissed off Colonel Kemp, and at one point he even threatened to remove funding. So when John Elwood received a strangely calm call from Kemp, he was caught off guard. He notes in his personal logs, just got a very strange call from Colonel Kemp. He asked what the status on the project was, and when I explained that we were still behind schedule, he didn't seem angry like he normally would. All he said was that it was very important that I keep the team working in the lab today, and that I contact him as soon as the project is complete. It almost feels like he was trying to tell me something, but I can't imagine what. John would later discover that Kemp's cryptic call was a warning about an impending attack. Later, the Commonwealth would be struck by several nuclear blasts. So, although it may not have been the best warning in advance, Cambridge Polymer Labs, more specifically John Elwood, was aware of the attack. But he's also not the only individual that anticipated a nuclear holocaust. Mr. House knew something was up too. Robert House was one of the nation's greatest minds and businessmen, acting as the CEO for the famed Robco Industries. But Robco wasn't the only business that he owned, no. Apart from Robco, Repcon, and H&H Tools, 
House also acquired one of the most prominent elements of the Las Vegas Strip, the Lucky 38 Resort and Casino. Now, Bobby House didn't purchase the casino just because. He knew something. Whether it be from one of his many military contacts or something else, House knew the apocalypse was on the horizon, and he had a plan. House went on modifying the building in preparation for the attack. His networked mainframes would be able to force transmit disarm codes to any warheads that got close to the building. If that didn't stop them, then his roof-mounted laser cannons would blast them out of the sky. He even crafted himself his own preservation chamber in the penthouse suite, where advanced life support technology would render him immortal. Being the ever so savvy entrepreneur, House would use the modified Lucky 38 to carve out his section of the post-nuclear wasteland. Or here's another for you, Eddie Winter. In a holotape addressed to his girlfriend Claire, Boston crime boss Eddie Winter would disclose the fact that he knew about an upcoming attack. Claire, it's me, Eddie. It's been too long, I know. But I'm okay. We're okay. I know it's weird me disappearing just when the heat died down, but there's a reason. What we talked about? It's happening. Soon. Bombs. Missiles. <laughs> I don't know what. But the end is coming. I can't even tell you how much I paid my cloak and dagger friend for this info. So I guess me building that shelter was a smart idea after all, huh? With this newly found knowledge, Eddie would subject himself to a measured amount of radiation causing him to transform into a ghoul before the bombs had even dropped. He planned to use his newly acquired immortality to pick back up where he started and rule the streets of Boston. Even some unnamed civilians were aware that something was going to happen soon. A foreman working at a factory near the Four Leaf fish packing plant noted a strange call from a past acquaintance in his personal log. Strange call from Levon. Haven't seen her since the briefing room in Portland, and now she calls me up about her nephew's baseball team. She must have been speaking in code, and I don't like what I think she meant. Sending the team home to be with their families, I'll just say it's a union thing. Although it's never explicitly mentioned, the foreman seems to have been aware what Levon was implying with their coded message as he sent his workers home. In the following entry, he writes, I was sleeping in my chair when it happened. They must have missed the city with the big one. Framingham's gone from what little I heard on the radio before it went quiet. Things aren't too good here either. At least I've got my little castle here to hole up in. I'd have probably been vaporized if I had been doing my regular thing when it came. Thanks, Levon. The foreman attributes his survival to Levon's call days earlier, so it would seem that they understood what Levon meant and was able to secure themselves at the factory in anticipation of the impending nuclear strike. Another notable person that knew of or anticipated a nuclear attack was Nuka-Cola founder and CEO John Caleb Bradburton. As many civilian companies in Fallout, so too did Nuka-Cola Corp catch the attention of the US military. General Braxton wished to use Brad Burton's beverage year division as part of Project Cobalt. This top secret project would see the flavor chemists move from working on soda to working on chemical and biological weapons. But Brad Burton wanted to be greatly compensated for loaning out his employees, and money didn't pique his interest. No, Brad Burton wanted protection. One of Brad Burton's personal logs dated March 17th, 2076 reads, General Braxton stopped by my office today. I already knew he was coming. My contacts in Washington DC saw to that. He asked for exactly what I expected. The use of Nukaworld's beverage ears for a military chemical and weapons program. I told him I'd do it if he gave me the information on the military's Leap X, Life Extension and Prolognation, program. The look on his face when I asked that was priceless. As expected, he said yes. The moment the Leap X data arrives, I'm putting the team to work on it right away. It's obvious that this world is headed for the end and I intend to outlast it all. So, it would seem that Brad Burton had quite an early warning about the impending Great War as the entry is dated a year and a half before the eventual apocalypse. In April 2077, Brad Burton would undergo a procedure that would extend his life indefinitely, at the cost of most of his body. Brad Burton would be left as a head in a jar, trapped alone in his office for two centuries. Alex Keller, a National Guardsman, was also aware that a massive global event was on the horizon, in a holotape addressed to his sister, Alex notes that, This thing with China, it's not going away. We're gonna try and get into one of those vaults. If that doesn't work, well, I have a backup plan. There's the secure bunker, another sort of vault, inside the National Guard Depot. And, look, no matter what it takes, the whole damn Keller family's gonna ride this storm out, but you've gotta get your ass home. Now. Alex Keller's tape is the first of five that document the Keller family's journey. As these tapes aren't dated, it's hard to tell when exactly Alex made the recording. 
As he does seem to have some sense of urgency, I can only assume that it was likely somewhat close to October 23rd, though we will never know for sure. And the last example of a company or individual knowing or anticipating the start of the Great War is the National Catastrophe Relief Auxiliary. The presiding officer of Response Unit MD-478, Nancy Croydon, notes in her personal log. We were mobilized in the early evening. My security clearance isn't high enough to know this on an official level, but I've got it on good authority that we're under threat of a Chinese attack. I don't dare share this with the girls. Most of them are a solid sort, but I can't trust that some won't desert to try and protect themselves or their families, and wind up spreading panic, especially on flimsy rumors based on even flimsier intelligence from DoD. So, although Nancy was a bit skeptical of the Department of Defense's intelligence, the fact that her unit was deployed on the night of October 22nd indicates that her higher-ups believe that an impending attack was imminent. Because so many people were at least anticipating the end of life as we know it, this leads me to my second misconception. Misconception number two. It took a while for humanity to recover. Because many of the games take place centuries after the Great War, and many times we play as a vault dweller, we never really get the chance to see what surface conditions were like immediately after the dropping of the bombs. We're told that no one has ever left the vault or that the surface is deadly, but where some might think that humanity and life remained dormant for a long time, people were back on their feet and doing their best to survive as little as two days after the first nuke fell. For starters, former MedTech Laboratories employee, Wayne Turnquist managed to escape the MedTech facility by overriding the building's lockdown and initiating an executive evacuation protocol. From here, he picked up his sons from Malden Middle School, and together the three would survive the havoc of the surface in their backyard bunker. They would wait for their wife and mother to arrive from her position at the Mass Bay Medical Center, but she would never show. Although a sheltered life isn't exactly thriving, by January 2078, Wayne, with the help from one of his former neighbors, started working on fortifying the neighborhood of the West Everett Estates. By April 2078, six months after the Great War, Wayne's kids finally got the chance to enjoy the outside world once again. Even earlier than Wayne's post-nuclear settlement was the establishment of the Charleston Emergency Government. A terminal noting the suspension of all vehicular registration and licensing services can be found in the Charleston Capitol Building. The notice is dated October 25th, 2077, and is from one Abigail Poole, Speaker of the House for the Charleston Emergency Government. Poole notes that the Capitol Building staff are ordered to help the first responders with delivering rations and anti-radiation chems to those in rural areas. Two days after the falling of the bombs, an emergency government was already operating, and although some disagreed with Poole being the government's representative, notably Tanner Holbrook as he was the rightful successor to the governorship, Poole was determined to help the other survivors of the Great War. In fact, much of Appalachia had a quick turnaround, though I suppose it was due to not being a significant target of the Great War. Factions like Elizabeth Taggarty and Roger Maxson's Brotherhood of Steel, David Thorpe and Harlan McClintock's Raiders, and Shannon and Frederick Rivers' Order of Mysteries quickly acclimated to their new post-war society. The Brotherhood would seek and hoard their technology. The Raiders started out as scavengers, but when they barely survived the harsh winter of 2078, a change in leadership would turn the group into raiders that we know today. And the Rivers' order would take in and teach girls and young women how to protect themselves and survive the wasteland. Humanity would survive and progress, one way or another. Misconception number three, it lasted a long time. When one hears the words Great War, one might expect several year-long campaigns across the globe with countless countries participating. World War I, a major global conflict that we're still seeing the effects of today, is still known as the Great War. It was the Great War before even the concept of Fallout existed. So when Fallout calls their major cataclysmic event in-game the Great War, it's easy to just make the assumption that it lasted years. And sure, while the resource wars lasted 25 years across several countries, the Great War did not. The Great War started and ended on October 23, 2077. The Switchboard Central Terminal in Lexington notes that USAF spotted possible Chinese aircrafts near the Bering Strait at 3.37 am. A little under six hours later, at 9.13 am, the government's nuclear detection system reported four possible nuclear launches. At 9.42 am, Pennsylvania and New York are confirmed to be hit by nuclear strikes. And at 9.47 am, the Switchboard and assumedly many other American facilities went offline likely due to several accompanying electromagnetic pulses as pointed out in director John Elwood's personal terminal at the Cambridge Polymer Labs. 
The Fallout 1 intro notes that in two brief hours, most of the planet was reduced to cinders. This would mean that the Great War, the near humanity ending apocalypse, would come to an end on a sunny Saturday morning, bringing much of society along with it. Misconception number four, X launched the nukes. I leave this entry as X launched the nukes because so many people I've talked to have their own fan theories. Some say it was China, some say it was the US government, some say it was the Enclave, others say it was vault Tech, some say it was the Zaytans, and others say it was Pam. My point is that with nearly every person, entity, country I've mentioned, there will always be someone else who says it wasn't them. Therefore I think that X launched the nukes is one misconception about Fallout's Great War. And instead of talking about who I think did it and why, I'll just go over the main theories I've heard and their supporting evidence. The first is of course China. This is the most accepted theory. Enclave President Dick Richardson, in a dialogue with the Chosen One, remarks that the United States was winning the Sino-American War before those damn Reds launched everything they had. Reds being China, of course. In addition to this, as I mentioned before, the switchboard terminal mentions that possible Chinese aircraft were spotted near the Bering Strait, and hours later four nuclear launches were reported. And finally, to add to this theory, Captain Zhao of the Yangtze stealth submarine fired all but one of his nuclear warheads. Now, of course, none of this evidence explicitly paints China as the one to start it, but it adds to the theory. Next up is the United States of America. Now, one might say, Nort, Nort, Dick Richardson said that China did it, so therefore China did it, right? And I say that Richardson has incentive to lie. Think about it, America has poured billions into this war, whether it be through manufacturing armaments, developing prototype weapons and technology, or just through research spending. America has invested an insane amount of resources into a war that started because of dwindling resources, and now that they have China pushed out of Alaska and have taken the war to their shores, they've reached the point of no return. As American forces pushed inwards to China's mainland, what was once a route turned into a stalemate. Fallout 4's newscaster mentions on a broadcast that Chinese forces may have finally been driven from Anchorage, but the conflict has transitioned into a frighteningly tense stalemate, with diplomacy all but suspended and conventional warfare taking a historic toll on both sides, many have wondered if the good old US of A hasn't finally entered into a fight it just can't win. And so, with billions of dollars spent, thousands of casualties endured, all that America has to show for it is a stalemate? Where do they go from here? The theory says nuclear weapons. The US initiates a nuclear strike, China responds, and then post-war US propaganda blames China in order to continue the war against them after the nuclear fallout has stopped raining from the skies. The next theory is that the Enclave did it. We know that the shadow government organization now known as the Enclave was around pre-war. And as the pre-war Enclave consisted of government officials, wealthy businessmen, and other powerful people, did they start the Great War in order to begin some sort of new world order? Well, this theory thinks so. If at one point in canon the Enclave wanted to start civilization in space, then them being the cause of the Great War isn't that far-fetched. This one is a big one, vault Tech. I think many people know my stance on this theory already, but did vault Tech launch the nukes? After all, the cancelled 1998 Fallout movie planned to have vault Tech being the ones to make the first strike, and even though later drafts of the movie's design document changed that fact, maybe the game developers want to put it back in. Further evidence comes from a logo that can be found on the town of Megaton's atomic centerpiece. Some have claimed that the Megaton bomb sports a vault Tech logo on it, indicating that they may have been the ones who sent a couple nuclear warheads flying. Here's the side by side of the two logos, I'll let you interpret that however you want. Aliens. Fallout 3's Mothership Zeta canonized little green men, and ever since, fans have speculated on their bigger role in the Fallout universe. Perhaps that role is as the destroyers of Earth. Alien Captive Recorded Log 17 is Exhibit 1. While the human voice audio is completely silent, subtitles show what the captive is saying. It reads, Our defenses consist of three battalions of light infantry, 34 pieces of field artillery, 108 armored vehicles, and 42 aerial vehicles. We have 38 ICBMs always on alert and ready to fire when the word is passed down from the White House. The codes to activate the launch sequences are, Ugh, no, I can't let you. Ugh, get out of my mind. The codes are, Ugh, no, I can't betray. Ah, my head, I can't, I won't. Ah. It then cuts out. 
The idea is that the alien captive has been mind controlled into giving the Zaytans a set of nuclear launch codes. The codes allowed the Zaytan aliens to launch the first strike on behalf of the US and doom the rest of the planet. The next theory is that PAM started the Great War. Predictive Analytic Machine, or PAM, was a computer AI developed by a joint project between the Defense Intelligence Agency and the military. The hope was that it could accurately predict future events by feeding it data with the hope that it would be able to foresee and stop a nuclear war before it ever happened. However, it would seem that PAM had an accuracy problem when it came to incorporating the human variable into her scenarios. This theory goes on to state that in an attempt to remove the human element from her calculations, she intentionally fed the US incorrect information regarding the impending nuclear strikes in the switchboard terminal. America sees the fake threats and counterlaunches their own nukes to unknowingly start the Great War and assure mutual destruction between all humans. Pam can now make her predictions sans the human variable. And the last theory is actually one that I had heard more recently. I'm not really sure how popular of a theory it is, but here it is anyway. Mexico started the Great War. With so much emphasis on the growing tensions between China and the US, maybe a third country wanted to try and knock both China and the US off the global stage and then claim the resources for themselves. And how could a weaker country accomplish this and take down two mega powers? Well, why not atomic bombs? And while admittedly there isn't much supporting evidence outside of some headcanon theories, hearing that another random country like Mexico, Canada, or Korea launched the first nukes is a bit refreshing, isn't it? But the thing is, is that it doesn't really matter who launched the first nuke. As the think tank once said, there is an expression in the wasteland, old world blues. It refers to those that are so obsessed with the past, they can't see the present, much less the future, for what it is. And while that saying can be applied to many aspects of fallout, and even life, if one spends too much time dwelling on who started the great war, they're kinda missing the point of the games. Anyway, all this theorizing has led me to my final misconception. Misconception number 5. vault Tech planned it. Okay, I'll admit it, this misconception may be a bit more fringe. That is to say most people don't believe it, but I've seen a vocal few saying that even if vault Tech didn't have the nuclear arsenal themselves to start the Great War, they orchestrated and planned it somehow. Because of that, it makes this list. Okay, now this one might seem similar to the past misconception, but it's not. I swear it, hear me out. This one is to say that 1. vault Tech didn't launch the nukes, but 2. they also had no incentive to want the world to end either. Think about it, right? What is vault Tech? At the end of the day, what are they? vault Tech is a business. And what is the primary goal of a business? To generate income and money. Now, why does somebody want money? Bear with me. To acquire goods and services. Having a fat stack of cash is only good in a society that recognizes the currency as having value. If there is no society that collectively says a $20 bill is worth $20, then having a lot of $20 bills is useless. vault Tech was being given a significant amount of work, and therefore money, to ease the minds of civilians. Why stop that cash flow and turn all the dollar bills you've received over the years into worthless pieces of cotton and linen? Maybe vault Tech wanted to rebrand as a post-war clothing company, making sweaters and t-shirts out of old bills? That's the only thing I can think of. It makes no sense for them to want World War III to happen. I like to compare vault Tech to an insurance company. They make money when bad things don't happen. They lose or have to pay out when bad things do happen. The insurance company collects monthly payments from you, and in the event that something bad does happen, they end up paying that money back to you. I don't really know if that analogy makes sense. I hope it does. Anyway, now if one was to say that vault Tech's primary goal wasn't to make money, but rather to perform these various social experiments in their vaults, that's great, we'll go over that too. Okay, just for some background information. Initially, the vault Tech vaults were intended for protecting part of America's population from not only nuclear hellfire, but also biological and chemical attacks too. However, the project was hijacked by the shadow government that operated behind the scenes. Under the orders from the group we now know as the Enclave, vault Tech would perform a series of grand and horrid human experiments in their vaults. And the thing about that is, they didn't need some apocalyptic event to happen to excuse the experiments. These social experiments likely would have happened even if the Great War didn't. Let me explain. For starters, some vaults were already active before the Great War begun. Vault 22 and Vault 87 immediately come to mind. 
A pre-war sign outside of Vault 22 gives a short explanation of the facility's purpose. Vault 22 was inhabited by scientists and horticulturalists who were experimenting with various crops in order to combat the growing global resource shortage and hunger. One notable project was the development of an advanced fertilizer that could not only improve crop yield, but also its resistance to insects, drought, and disease. As for the second, Vault 87 finished construction in December 2071. Around 2076, the original vault experiment was scrapped, and the facility was converted into a research center focused on studying the effects of the forced evolutionary virus. Dr. Wayne Merrick would lead the evolutionary experimentation program, where he and his team of scientists would subject some of the vault's residents to FEV for studying and testing. And sure, while this doesn't exactly provide good solid evidence that Vault 87 was in operation before the war, a cut terminal entry may shed a bit of light regarding the vault's operation. An entry titled, Mission Suspended reads, I'm quite sad to report that due to a direct hit from what I presume to be a nuclear weapon on the entry area of Vault 87, we will be unable to provide the scouting reports as outlined in Vault Tech's operations manual. The main door to Vault 87 is damaged beyond repair, and we are detecting extremely high levels of lethal radiation outside the entry tunnel. So it seems that a direct hit from a nuclear weapon stopped the vault's ability to follow through on their vault operation duties. To me, this means that the vault was in operation before the Great War. A nuke hit Vault 87's entrance, and this explosion and radiation leak led to the vault's mission being suspended. So, at least two vaults were in operation before the war. Now, one might say, but Nort, if vault Tech and the Enclave planned to perform these experiments before nuclear annihilation happened, how would they get their vault dwellers? Who would go into a fallout shelter when there's no fallout? And to that I say, they would find a way. The Enclave would fabricate some lie to get people to participate in their wicked experiments, send out a letter saying that vault Tech needs to perform a month-long drill and attendance is mandatory, drive up land value and tell people that they can move into the vault instead, Heck, even frame it as a social experiment, but don't mention the messed up parts. The government would find a way. The CIA got away with the MKUltra program, why can't the Enclave get away with Project Safehouse? Now, I know that some vault experiments are directly involved with the Great War, like Vault 12's door not being able to fully seal, so that experiment likely wouldn't have been able to happen pre-Great War, but the point still stands regardless. To recap, vault Tech didn't plan the Great War because 1. It's not profitable. Money proved to lose immense value post-war, so why take money to expend billions of dollars in manpower and resources to build these fallout shelters? And two, they can run many experiments with or without the Great War happening. Bad people will always find ways to do bad things. And that is 5 Misconceptions about Fallout's Great War. If you have any other ideas for these 5 misconception videos, feel free to let me know in the comments. If you liked the video, be sure to share and subscribe. Have a good rest of your day. Cheers. You're already cleared for entrance. It's just a matter of verifying some information. Don't want there to be any holdups in the unforeseen event of <laughs> total atomic annihilation. <laughs> Won't take but a moment. Now I can't wait for the world to end.